Hi there. In this educational video, we are going to talk about how the majority of your bones form. Broadly speaking, bone formation is called osteogenesis, whereby a mostly bony skeleton is formed during embryonic development. Osteogenesis involves ossification, a process of making bone via one of two processes. First, ossification of fibrous membranes is called intramembranous ossification and occurs to develop the cranial bones and the clavicles. Ossification of hyaline cartilage is called endochondral ossification and occurs to develop all the other bones of the body. Now because endochondral ossification leads to the development of most bones of your body, this is what is going to be the focus of this video. Now the importance of using hyaline cartilage for early skeletal development is that it is a flexible yet durable tissue. It allows for rapid mitosis to occur while being flexible enough for the development and remodeling of a growing bone to occur. I want to start by introducing the major cells or players involved in endochondral ossification. First, Let's introduce the origin of most bone cells. These are called osteogenic cells and are the progenitors to osteoblasts. You can think of osteogenic cells as the baby bone cells. Second, we have osteoblasts, which are actively mitotic, just like closely related fibroblasts in connective tissue proper and chondroblasts in cartilage. You can think of osteoblasts as the growing pre-teenager bone cells. Osteoblasts function in the creation of new bone by secreting bone matrix called osteoid and depositing calcium into this matrix to harden the bone. Third, we have osteocytes, which mature from osteoblasts once the bone matrix is fully formed. You can think of osteocytes as the adult bone cells. Osteocytes function in the monitoring and maintain, maintaining of bone. Importantly, osteocytes can detect and respond to increased mechanical stress and damage by communicating with osteoblasts and osteoclasts. This allows bone to be remodeled as needed and also repaired when fractured. Fourth, and lastly, we have osteoclasts, which are derived from the same hematopoietic stem cells as macrophages. These cells are giant macrophage-like cells that function in bone resorption, that is, the breakdown of bone. Now, you may ask, why break down bone in the first place? Well, Breaking down bone can be a response to low blood calcium levels to get these levels back up to a homeostatic level so you can use calcium for cardiac function and neurotransmission, among other important physiological processes. Breaking down bone is also important when old bone needs to be remodeled and remade to ensure durability and proper functioning as we go through life. Altogether, these are the four major cell types involved in endochondral ossification, making that new bony skeleton out of a hyaline cartilage skeletal model. Let's now turn our attention to the actual steps involved in endochondral ossification. The very first step to initiate endochondral ossification is the infiltration of small blood vessels into the perichondrium which is the outer layer of cartilage, thus delivering the very, very first osteogenic cells. These osteogenic cells differentiate and develop into osteoblasts, which will then begin to secrete osteoid along the outer edges of that cartilaginous diaphysis. The secreted osteoid ends up encasing the cartilaginous diaphysis in a bone collar. The bone collar is an area of vascularized periosteum, outer layer of bone, that is important for stabilizing the growing bone. Shortly after the bone collar is formed, 
ossification begins at the primary ossification center, which is located at the center of the cartilaginous diaphysis. The primary ossification center is so named because it is the first area where extensive endoconsal ossification in bone formation occurs. The primary ossification center is at the center of the cartilaginous diaphysis and where bone formation begins. The endochondral ossification that occurs here is sort of a dark process for the cells involved because essentially what happens is the killing and replacement of chondrocytes, cartilage cells, with calcified osteoid and osteocytes, bone cells. As osteoblasts secrete osteoid, it wraps around the chondrocytes and becomes calcified. The calcification cuts the chondrocytes off from nutrients and oxygen. Therefore, they die. And this will leave open spaces in the bone called lacunae. At this point, this is compact bone. The lacunae become occupied by the osteocytes, the quote-unquote mature osteoblasts which will now monitor and maintain the newly formed compact bone. The process of wrapping chondrocytes with osteoid, calcifying it, and making new compact bone occurs continuously. Therefore, as time continues, more and more compact bone is made throughout this diaphysis. Importantly, as new compact bone is made, New cartilage grows at the proximal and distal ends of the diaphysis, thereby elongating the entire structure. Throughout this entire process, the bone collar is there to stabilize the structure to prevent collapse. Eventually, the next major event occurs, which is the invasion of the periosteal bud. The periosteal bud contains a large artery a large vein, nerve fibers, red bone marrow elements, and even more osteogenic cells which will develop into even more osteoblasts, meaning more bone formation. What are also now arriving are osteoclasts, the bone resorbers, which are responsible for the breakdown of bone. Osteoclasts are important here because they will erode the recently made compact bone of the diaphysis, thus forming numerous small holes that ultimately fuse together to begin forming the medullary cavity. The medullary cavity will be lined by spongy bone, essentially partially eroded compact bone. You can think of this process in regards to a slice of delicious cheese. After some erosion in the center of the cheese slice, nibbling little bites, it will begin to develop holes. Now it's Swiss cheese. This is like spongy bone. If enough erosion occurs, like taking multiple little bites in the center of the cheese slice, eventually a complete hole will develop. This is just like the medullary cavity. So altogether, the entire process just described of osteoblasts secreting osteoid around chondrocytes and making new bone as osteoclasts resorb the newly formed bone continues throughout the diaphysis. This continuation allows for the continued development of the bony diaphysis and the continued elongation and opening up of the medullary cavity which will ultimately run the length of the entire diaphysis. As more and more bone is created in the diaphysis and the medullary cavity continues to elongate, eventually secondary ossification centers appear at the epiphyses, which are at each end of the growing bone. These secondary ossification centers appear just following birth. At this point, the epiphyses begin the processes of endochondral ossification thus beginning to gain bony tissue. Ossification of the epiphyses occurs in much the same way that it does in the diaphysis. 
osteoblasts secrete osteoid, wrapping around the chondrocytes, which then becomes calcified. This initially results in a development of new compact bone. However, as this new bone is made, osteoclasts partially erode or resorb the bone away. This process continues in each epiphysis, ultimately leading to the development of spongy bone throughout each epiphysis. Eventually, you end up with two epiphyses composed of spongy bone, each having a single epiphyseal plate. It is here at the epiphyseal plates where the remaining hyaline cartilage rapidly divides, making more and more layers of cartilage that can then be ossified into bone. As all these layers of cartilage are ossified, more and more bone is made and the entire bone elongates. In mammals, such as humans, this process, called epiphyseal bone growth, continues up to puberty, at which point maxillal bone length has been achieved and no further bone growth or ossification will occur.